there are those of us who like to doodle. If you are one of those, we have a surprise for you this year. They're in the pews in front of you. If they are not, just ask somebody behind you. If you like to doodle, we now are supplying you with paper and pencils to draw pictures. Now, should they be of the pastor, and they are of such quality as needs to be shared with him afterwards, you are welcome. However, there are those of us in the congregation who have actually bought the doodling Bible. She's not here today, so I can say, hi, Inga. She's probably watching at home. But she doodles in the Bible, and it's nice to color pages, and you're in, including your own thoughts as you read Scripture. That's a good thing. I'd say that's a good thing for the new year. If you look at my Bible, you will find lots of notes in the margins, and I've attempted a number of times to find another Bible that would give me more space to put in to my notes in as well, because the fact is that as we read Scripture, which I'm encouraging you to do again for this new year, then you will have the opportunity to put the thoughts that God gives you in alongside, because as I go back then and read, I say to myself, oh, is that what I thought back in 2005? Now I know something different, and, and God has shown me a different perspective on this particular text, and it's enlarged, and it means more. Or maybe it's simply that I'm older, and I've, I've had more of life, and so therefore I have a different perspective. I honestly believe that every year that goes by, uh, we have the opportunity to see the things of God in a new way. So as we begin this new year, we can say again, uh, Happy New Year. Uh, it, uh, happy New Year, I, I hope, or we, we, we hope it's going to be a happy new year. Uh, Christmas has passed. Uh, the hustle and bustle of Bethlehem or Santa Clarita, whichever place you shopped this Christmas, uh, <clears throat> uh, we, we stopped, and, and, and at this Christmas, we, we wondered. We wondered as, as we're wandering through our life, we, we wondered. We, I don't know about you, but I, I felt the pull. I felt the pull between the two worlds, between the two, the two worlds. We celebrated the tear in the fabric. This is a, a picture that one author gives that if you think of this world as being enveloped in its own space, as it were, that God, God cuts a hole in that fabric and he tears it open and in comes, in comes Jesus, in comes the angels. God is, is fashioned into humanity with, with his own thoughts and his own ideas and it's still such a mystery how this all happens. Cooperation with the human birth process to introduce himself to humanity. This, this vortex, as it were, is opened. It's announced by shepherds, by, to the shepherds, by angelic hosts. And God steps into the world. He came to his own, the Bible says, uh, his own, and they did not know who he was, the old spiritual says, and we, we didn't know who you were. Foreigners traveled, and I'm going to talk about this maybe later on in the year, but foreigners traveled from the far, far east to see for themselves. But those that Jesus came to were not paying attention. The far easterners were paying attention. And they were warded off, as we remember, they were warded off Going, going to see Herod for the second time, they were warded off by a dream. Because you see, with Herod, the human leader on the spot, our very first action uh, in response to a new king being born, to this mysterious event where the fabric 
between the two worlds is torn apart and God comes to visit us, our response to that is to try and kill him. So Joseph, also warned in a dream, flees to Egypt with Mary. Happy New Year. Happy New Season. But what, but what year is it? What, what, kind, what kind of year do we think that 2018 will be? After Jesus came back home from Egypt to Nazareth, we, we don't know much about him. As a child, I, I did the JMV and I did the MV. And those of you who did what I did, you know what I'm talking about. Those of the rest of you don't care because it didn't happen in your life. And, and, and we don't even have a strong, what we call, AY program. That does mean Adventist youth. And I learned this text as part of the schoolwork that you do for JMV. Luke 2.52. It kind of rolls off your tongue easily, so it's easy to remember. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And, and that's, that's what we get. That's about all we get for the first 30 years of Jesus' life. So what was he doing? Well, uh, I, I believe he, he was, the Bible says he was obedient. He was obedient to his parents. And with that, I'm going to, to infer that he was obedient to the traditions of his day. He was obedient to having a career in the same way that, that his dad had one because that's what you did. If you were born into the family of a carpenter, the likelihood of you becoming a carpenter was almost 100%. The difference came if you went to school in the early part of your school years and the rabbi said to you three words, which again, bear a whole nother opportunity for us to get together and discuss them. Come, follow me. Ever heard those words come out of Jesus' mouth? If the rabbi said to you after school, come follow me, it meant you passed. I think you're good enough to be the next rabbi. You're not going home to your dad to do what he did. Your path is going to be different from all the rest who I didn't ask to follow me. Implied is you graduated you're good enough. So I want that to percolate for a moment and realize that Jesus uses those same words. That's why, like I said, it bears a whole nother discussion. When Jesus says to people who have nets in their hands, who didn't pass, who were back doing what their fathers did before them, fishing, on Lake Galilee, when Jesus points to them and says, come, follow me. The impact of those words to those men. And then the prescription saying, I am going to make you fishers of men. It's incredible. We don't, that's why I said we need more time to unpack it. That's all we know about Jesus. He became the son of a carpenter. He became a carpenter. And I like to think that when he did get the chance to invite people to follow him, that some of those very same people were people he had done business with. The people that he had grown up with. In fact, as Chris and I have studied this, my wife and I, we have uh, come to the conclusion that a lot of Jesus' disciples were related to him. Ask me how, and I'll just tell you, when he's on the cross, what does he say to the Apostle John? Whose mother is standing at the foot of the cross too. And his mother too. 
And he gives John the opportunity to be the caretaker of his mother, who we believe is actually his aunt. So there's a relationship, there's a, there's a picture that emerges about what Jesus was doing for these first 30 years of his life if we are willing to just dig a little bit into the relationships that are there and look more closely. But he becomes 30 years old. He's 30 years old, and apparently in Scripture and in, in the Hebrew culture, 30 becomes this age of starting your life's work. You are now a journeyman carpenter. You can go off, you can branch out, you can, you can do your own thing now at the age of 30. I also believe that it was the age at which you were now allowed to serve as a priest. If you are from a priestly family, you now have the opportunity to take your place if your, uh, if the, your number comes up, so to speak, because we are given to understand that not all people from a priestly family were invited, not all men were invited to serve in the temple, that it was a great honor. Remember Zechariah, John's dad. And the fact that he was in the temple when the angel came and talked to him about John, who was Jesus' cousin. He's 30 years old. Jesus goes to work. He goes to work as a Messiah. This is why God went to all the trouble. He went to all the trouble so that Jesus could be deployed as God with us. Again, this, thank you, again with this, this idea that, that there's this need for this rebellious planet to be saved, and he breaks in with this plan, and the plan is Jesus. And so at age 30, he begins to unfold in a very direct way the plan that had been formulated before the earth was made. And by the way, uh, if your children were in Sabbath school today, they reviewed the seven days of creation. It's good to review. I mean, when was it that the fish were made? It's good to review that this God who made heaven and earth in a mysterious, very, very amazing way brings himself into the form of a baby, breaks into our society, then lives mysteriously again for 30 years amongst us. And then begins to be the Messiah. You see, God wanted us to all have the opportunity to see, to hear, and as John says in his gospel, to touch. I mean, this is kind of what separated the, the disciples from those who came afterwards and why maybe they called them apostles is because these are people who, who actually saw the living Christ. These are people, he says, we touched him. God, God wanted our senses to be involved in all aspects so that there would be no doubt whatsoever that this indeed was the same God who made heaven and earth. He reveals himself in terms humanity, uh, you and I, can grapple with. It's difficult to deal with the idea that God lives in many other dimensions than we know and understand. But he broke into our dimension so that we could understand him. You see, that's why the scripture says that darkness, the people had been living in darkness that blocked out all the truth about God. And so the light had to come. It had to come to illuminate the reality of God's love, John 3.16, for how much of the world? All. So I'd, I'd like to say, for God's love for all the world. Out of the whole human family, uh, God chooses Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants to be the flag bearers, if you like. Okay? <coughs> They're, they're the ones who are, who are waving the flag of God's people for all of that time by choice. Out of all of the human family at that time, he chooses Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and, and their descendants. However, over, over centuries of tradition and, and then even in their acute 
anticipation just before Jesus comes, they somehow miss him. Could it be because they were preoccupied with their own, maybe their own ideas and, and, and their own perspectives? Why, why after all of this centuries, all of the time when they were claiming to be God's people, why, why did they miss him? Missed him when he, when he finally came. So, so Jesus goes to work. Goes to work as the Messiah. He has, to, he has to spell out, he has to spell out the measurements, as it were, that heaven is going to use on all those who would like to say that they are part of the kingdom of God. He's going to tell a story. He's going to reveal who God is. And then he's going to say, do you believe me? If you believe me, then this is how you will be. You will be this way because you believe the stories that I'm going to tell you about who God is. That's why Jesus came. He had a story to tell because the story that had been told since Adam and Eve had caused the people to be in darkness. So the light comes and he says, I've got a new story. If you want to be a part of my kingdom for real, then this is what you'll need. First of all, you'll need to be awake. Awake. You'll, you'll not need to be asleep. You, you don't need to be like those individuals who, when I first came, like Herod, were very angry with me for coming. So Jesus, he starts his ministry and he starts like this. Blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus is going to give us now a progression, as it were, a progression of what it will be like to be one of his people in his kingdom. In Matthew chapter 5, five and 6, we, we specifically have the opportunity to hear from Jesus about his kingdom. And so over the next uh, month here at Santa Clarita. We're going to have a couple of these every week. The first one is blessed are the, those who are poor in spirit. Poor in spirit. It's not exactly what you expect a great God to say. But right away, I want to let you know that this is not a negative. Being poor in spirit is not what you would think. It might be that the spirit that is being talked about by Jesus here is a, an assumption about yourself. Maybe you are, are, are poor in your idea about whether or not you can save yourself. And he is saying, that's a good thing. What about if we were to say, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, blessed are those who, who don't believe that the, the system in the world today, the, the economy of this world can save us. That would be a very countercultural attitude, would it not? At the beginning of 2018, as the stock market seems to be becoming superheated, what if we're saying, I don't believe that the economy of this world, led by the most grand country on earth, the United States of America, that it can save us. Are we, are, are we not American supporters if we, if we talk like that? But this, this first blessed says, blessed are those who are not trusting in themselves who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who realize their need for God. Remember the song, I've already sung it, and we didn't know who you were. What happened? You had a people who were waiting and waiting and waiting for the Messiah, and then when he actually comes, they miss him. Would, would I like to repeat that history as an Adventist? Heck no. 
Wait all my life for Jesus to come for the second time and then he comes and I, and I don't know? Or I'm, I'm, I'm not aware? Or, I mean, how, how, do you, how do you reconcile that in your life? So Jesus says, you know what? You can't do it. You're, you're unable to do it. I need to do it for you. And so his very first blessed is, blessed are you when you realize you cannot do it for yourself. Blessed are you when you realize you need God. You're poor in, in pumping up yourself. You're, you're not about the culture of this world that says, you know, I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest. You're about saying, God is the greatest. Blessed are the poor in spirit. They, they know that they want to cross over and be part of God's kingdom. They know that they have been rebellious in the past, and they want to not be rebellious anymore, and yet they realize this is a happy new year, and I want it all to be new, and I want it all to be different, and, and the only way that that's going to happen is if we, we stop depending on ourselves to get us there. Blessed are the poor in spirit because they are confident in Jesus and not in themselves. Number two, blessed are those who mourn. By the time uh, Jesus says this, uh, several things have happened. He's, he's lived over 30 years at this point and he has seen the culture he has been part of the culture. We know that he came to church uh, when he went to church that one time in Nazareth. Uh, the Bible says, as was his custom, he, he met together. Sin, synagogue means the gathering place. Simply means where we gather together, where synergy happens. So I want you to know that, that there's a miracle that happens every time we gather together like this. That we are greater we are greater in the, than the sum of our parts because the Holy Spirit is here to bless and to multiply. I, I often say to the leaders of this church, we, we are simply offering loaves and fishes. I mean, think about it. You're going you're to sit here very kindly and listen to me for maybe 25, 35 minutes on a Sabbath morning. If you were to come every Sabbath, that would be 25, 35 minutes, 52 times. So let's say half an hour times 52, that's 25, 26 hours out of 365 days. And I think that somehow, maybe you think that somehow, that's going to be enough. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? I need more. It's not going to be enough. And the stuff we get when we get together, this miracle that happens, is just like the loaves and fishes. Five loaves and two fishes. That's all. But in the Master's hand, in the miraculous hands of Jesus, He breaks those, that bread and, and, and those fish and feeds full 5,000 men not including the women and children that were there. I like to say there were at least one woman and one child, so maybe 15,000 or 20,000 with five loaves and two fish. That's a miracle. So if you want to witness a miracle every week, come together and see what God does with the coming together that we do because he's going to... Break it just like he broke those loaves and fishes and he is going to do miraculous things with us. But I know that I need more, so I need to study my Bible in the morning. I need to hear from God. I need to sing songs of praise to him in worship. I need to do those things that will help me personally on a daily basis because I don't get enough just out of church. I have the opportunity to meet with many of you at, at, at times and, and that's great. It's still not enough. 
Because when you look at the time that is passing, the amount of time, it is just so little that we have together. Therefore, blessed, blessed are those, Jesus says, who mourn. And here's why they mourn. They mourn for three reasons. Number one, they mourn because of their own sins. They mourn because they know that there are things that they have done that have hurt Jesus. I've said this before and I'll say it again right now. There's a difference between sin, there's a difference between sin and sins. Sin, quite honestly, is a broken relationship with God. Just think about the branch and the vine that Jesus talked about. If the branch is not connected to the vine, it doesn't get the sap. Very simple. So here am I. If I decide I'm not going to be connected, then I'm not connected and I'm not getting nourished. Okay? But sins, sins are those actions that I take when I am not connected. Do you see the, do you see the progression? So a being in sin means that the things that I do, everything that I do, does not come from God anymore. It comes from this broken relationship. So that is why when Jesus comes into the world, his job is to connect us back to God so that what flows out of us, the fruit that comes from us, is no longer sins, but it is acts of righteousness. I don't know if it's ever dawned on your consciousness that this is how simple it is, but that's how simple it is. In Christ, acts of righteousness. Separated from Christ, sins. Okay? So don't let the language mess you up. Just understand it's all about the fruit. It's all about what we produce. And if we're connected to God, we're going to produce acts of righteousness. If we're disconnected, it's going to be it's going to be helpful to the evil empire. That's what it's going to be. So, first of all, those who mourn, mourn because there have been times in their life when they have been disconnected from God, and what happened as a result of that disconnection hurt the kingdom of God. So, maybe, maybe that's a new thought for you. But that you come to God and say, God, what I did today did not help you. I love you. I have never stopped loving you. But when I said that to my, my wife, it, it didn't make her aware that I love you. It made her maybe think that uh, I love someone else, like the evil one. See how that works? For me, this is one of the reasons that people mourn. This is one of the reasons that I come to God and say, God, I am sorry. I am sorry that my actions today did not help your kingdom. Second reason is we mourn because of the situation that humanity is in. It's a larger picture, and I hope that we spend time thinking about it more often, maybe in 2018, than we have ever before. The fact that we live in such a nice town, the fact that we live in such uh, opulence, I'm going to use it, I'm going to use that word. It's a nice big word, I hope you don't mind, but it's, you know, compared to probably 80% of the rest of the world, the way in which we live, the security that we have, the, 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 the fact that, that we can eat three meals a day, that we drive a car. And the, you know, somebody has said, if you have change in your car, if you have change in your car, you are more wealthy than 80% of the world, maybe even 90. That you would care so little for those quarters and nickels and dimes and pennies that you just throw them into a box in your car. Because of the people in this world who literally will be getting their food from the garbage dump today. So blessed are you, my friends, blessed, Jesus says, are all of us, if we realize that the situation in the world today is not as our Father in heaven would want it to be. And that we mourn because of that. And then connected to that, 
related to that because those situations that people find themselves in often are the cause for them to become disconnected from God. Number three, we mourn for those who are disconnected from God. So if that's yourself, or you're mourning for yourself and you're asking God to reconnect you, praise God. But what about this? My friend said it the other day, uh, and I know that some of you may come from this background religiously, and, and so I, I hope this is not offensive to anyone uh, in the hearing of my voice, but I had a friend who once said to me, if, if the Catholics aren't going to heaven, I don't want to go to heaven either. Do you mourn? Do you mourn for those who are not connected to God? Jesus says in his opening salvo, in his, in his opening words of his messianic ministry, after we know so little about him for the first 30 years, in that, in that moment when he opens his mouth to say, this is what I'm all about. The first two things he says just absolutely smash my world. I don't know about you. You're not able to save yourself. Blessed are you if you realize it. Wow. And here I thought that, you know, I was able to save. And, by the way, blessed are you when you're more worried about the people who are not connected to me than you are about yourself. Wow, really? I mean, that, that just smacks my selfishness right upside the head. My attitude of, of survival, my attitude of making sure that I get everything that I think that I deserve. Bam! Not interested in knowing about that, son, says Jesus to me. I'm interested in whether you are interested in the person who doesn't have a relationship with me that will save them for eternity. Do you mourn for them? Do you, do you pray that there will be some way in which you can be a part of bringing them closer to me? Is that your attitude? And I say, Jesus, I need so much help. I, I need that attitude in my life in 2018. I need to, to want what you want. I need my heart to break for the same things that break your heart, God. That your family, your human family is, is rejecting you on such a massive scale in the world today. Should that not wake us up every morning saying, God, what can I do in my sphere of influence to turn that tide? Lead me to the person who is drowning in their own loneliness because they are not connected to you, because they don't feel worthy even of themselves. They are upset with themselves and they're angry and, and they want to lash out. God, please help me to know that when they are doing that, it's because they are disconnected from you. And that I know, I know what it feels like to be connected to you. God, please help me to help them to want to be connected with you. Blessed are those who mourn. We, we have so much opportunity in 2018. When you... <laughs> When you have a chance to draw a picture of 2018 next year, are there going to be some doodlings about you and God holding hands and walking in paths that you never thought that you would go? Wow. And that he gives you the strength and that he gives you the power and that as a result there are other people that you are now holding on to and that God is witnessing in their life the transformation that he wants all of our lives to be a witness to this transforming power that we have chosen as a congregation to make a part of our mission statement 
the transforming love of God, that we would share it, that we would celebrate it. 2018. Happy New Year.